Hello everyone, my name is Malcolm Oliver and I'm very excited to be here today to discuss the impact of internet technology upon higher education in the United States. Just initially to start off with, there are 19.3 million students enrolled in post-secondary institutions in the United States, but only 32% of them have ever taken one or more online classes. That means that there's tremendous growth in this opportunity area, but the problem that institutions are having and moving this area is that uh, uh, taking what's done well in the classroom and transitioning that into the online environment is proving to be a tremendous challenge. On most university campuses, there are uh, classrooms and there are computer labs, but these two very important things are separated within the same uh, physical space. However, there's been something happening in our society uh, over the past couple of years. In general, the cell phone, uh, uh, the smartphone, has really been impacting the way in which we consume information uh, within our society. This, coupled with the rise of adult learners, has brought about 15% of uh, uh, college and university students fully online, which is about 3 million students. Now, what we've seen also, stepping back a little bit, we can see that um, in terms of higher education in general, um, uh, most of the students who take online courses are undergraduates, uh, about 5.2 million. Uh, and there are a small percentage, 1.1 million graduate students who take online courses. Now, with that, we see that there are a couple of very large providers of fully online education. And they're so large that they really are exponentially larger than most online providers of higher education. Um, so what we're going to do is take a deeper dive Hello Isabel, I hope this online training about the impact of the internet on higher education doesn't get long and boring. I need to prepare my lecture for class tonight. You are super funny Adam. It has only been going on for a few minutes. I am glad this training is online. The previous director had instructors on campus all day, then we had to teach at night. You hit it on the nail Isabel. Well, to be honest, I was looking at some of the topics that will be covered, and some of the data that Malcolm will present on the growth of the internet will be interesting. I thought the same Adam. The training also provides the content for the assessment that we need to complete at the end of the training. What assessment, Isabel? We have to do some work too? Did you even read the invitation, Adam? It says that all instructors need to complete the training in order to be assigned online courses for next year. This is as part of a series of five trainings. Next week will be the training for developing online courses. When did teaching become so complicated? I am reading over the document now, and after we view the next part of the training we have a list of questions to answer which are provided at the end of the video. I am very glad we talked Adam, so please let me know if you need anything else. Have a great day. The world is currently going through a process of a revolution that is transforming all aspects of human civilization. The ways in which we communicate, learn, listen, consume are all experiencing a rapid transformation that is impacting human societies socially, economically, and politically. This transformation was initiated by the continual advancement of computers and rapidly accelerated with the development of a, a faster and faster internet, and now with the uh, increased utilization of the smartphone. One interesting statistic that highlights this fact is that in the year 2000, 
there were 413 million internet use users globally, but in 2016, this number rapidly increased to 3.4 billion people. This is now 51% of the global population, and the top countries with inter internet users are China, with 750 million, India, with 391 million, the United States, with 245 million, Brazil, with 126 million, and Japan, with 116 million. More than 360 million people came online for the first time in the year 2018. New users are growing at a rate of more than 11 per second, or that's 1 million new users each day. To provide you with the context of what 3 million people would look like, here is a photo of Copacabana Beach in Brazil in 2013 when Pope Francis visited. Most of this new growth in internet users is taking place in Asia. As you can see from the table uh, provided, India added 97 million new users simply in the year of 2018. This was followed by China, which added 50 million new users in one single year. This is phenomenal growth. To gain a better understanding of why India is leading the world in new internet users, we can take a look at this graph, which shows the cost of mobile internet around the world. The average cost of one gigabyte of mobile service in India is 26 cents, which is the cheapest in the world. Alternatively, in the United States, this same one gigabyte on average would cost about $12.37. This low cost of internet service, also with the low cost of cell phones in India, make uh, are driving this rapid expansion in cell phone technology. To get a better understanding of the cost of cell phones in India, what I'm going to do is uh, do a Google search of cheap cell phones in India. And it really gives you a, a range of the price for four, about 4,000 rupees, 2,000 rupees, 3,000 rupees, and 4,000 rupees. And there's some brand names there. But also you can go to Amazon India and look at what comes up. They'll show you best sellers at around 1300, but you can also scroll down and see that they're in the 6,000, 5,000 uh, price range. And there are even some uh, for around uh, under 1,000 uh, rupiah. To gain a better understanding of what 1,000 rupiah is, we can go to the currency converter and see that 1,000 Indian rupees will be about 14 US dollars. Uh, 5,000 Indian rupees will be about 70 US dollars. And 10,000 will be about 140 US dollars. Now that we've done a review of how many people are actually on the internet, let's come back to the United States and see how people are actually using, uh, interfacing with the internet when they're on it. As you can see, for the most part, People are using their desktop, laptop, and mobile devices to connect to the internet. But over the last 10 years, people have spent about two hours consistently on the internet with their desktop and laptop. But on the other hand, the inter -connect their connectivity to the internet through the mobile phone has risen dramatically to a total of 3.6 hours per day. So the average adult user in the United States interfaces with the internet about 6.3 hours per day. Now that we know that people are spending about 6.3 hours a day on the internet, let's now turn our attention to see what it is that they're actually doing when interfacing with the internet. A large segment of the time when people are interfacing with the internet, they are actually on social media platforms. Uh, on average, individuals spend 
144 minutes per day. That's two hours and 24 minutes uh, interfacing with social media. And that's also on the increase because this is an hour more than it was in 2012. Now there has been quite a bit of research done on what specific social media platforms are people using when they are online. And by this graph you can see that Facebook is still, uh, remains and is still the largest social media platform in which 30% of the individuals on the internet are uh, utilize Facebook monthly and weekly. Now YouTube is also on the rise. It's the second largest uh, uh, application on the internet, interface with the internet. And WhatsApp is the third largest at 25%. WeChat um, uh, uh, serves 23% of internet users, uh, but that is a Chinese, um, that's for uh, target the individuals in China. And then you have Instagram, which they recently passed the 1 billion uh, uh, subscriber mark, so they are very large. Before you is a graph of social network users, um, and you can see that Facebook has 2.375 billion users. YouTube has 2 billion users, WhatsApp 1.6 billion, and Facebook Messenger 1.3 billion. Um, and the list goes on, but you, as you can see, there are uh, very few, very large social networks out there, but these uh, uh, social networks really control it, most individuals interface with the internet. So when they go onto the internet, most individuals are using these applications to access the information uh, and the communications and the connections that they want to interface with. There's also a remarkable and notable trend with regard to the watching of video on the social media networks. As you can see by viewing this graph, TV is the dominant way to view video in the United States. However, you can also see that digital, the viewing of digital video through the internet is consistently on the rise over the past eight years and, ex as, and is expected to continue to grow. This trend is really highlighted by the short stories movement in which videos are uploaded to the social media sites by users and they disappear within 24 hours there are actually 1.5 billion daily active viewers on just three stories sites, which are Instagram stories, WhatsApp status, and Facebook messenger stories. If you have any curiosity upon where that content is coming from, here are a couple of examples of how our young people are using this technology. In the United States, the streaming and downloading of online audio is at also very popular. It's estimated that 67% of the population streams or downloads audio, with a podcast being a large driver in the growth of this uh, uh, sector. There are actually 70 million individuals in the United States who download podcasts over the past month the most popular podcasts by rankings are The Daily, which is published by the New York Times, This American Life, which is published by This American Life uh, and Serial, Stuff You Should Know by iHeartRadio, Up First by NPR, The Ben Shapiro Show by The Daily Wire. Many people are very familiar with these shows and they, they attract quite an odd of followership. We will now turn our attention to the colleges and universities of America and see how this internet revolution is impacting the higher education industry. The 
key place to look to assess the impact of the internet on higher education is the development and provision of online courses. During the fall of 2016, there were 19.8 million students enrolled in post-secondary institutions in the United States, which is almost 1 million less than their peak in 2011. As enrollment decreases on colleges and university campuses, tuition and fees continue to increase, which has also contributed to the large student loan debit which we see in this nation today. When taking a closer look at enrollments, we can see that most college students are, are enrolled in two-year undergraduate programs or in four-year bachelor's degrees and then a smaller number are in the postgraduate degree programs. By viewing the graph on the right, we can see that there has been a continual increase in the amount of students that are taking online courses at colleges and universities across the nation. In 2018, at least 6.2 million students, which is 32-33%, have taken at least one online course at some point in their college career. However, that means that 67% uh, of students, which is over, which is about 14 million, have never taken an online course. At the other end of the spectrum, there are about 2.9 million students, or only 15%, who are enrolled into exclusively online programs. This number is uneven, with 12.9% at the undergraduate level, but with 27.5% at the graduate level. This table here provides us with a snapshot of fully online universities in the United States. And as we can see, the bulk of students are currently enrolled in public universities. And there are quite a few very large public universities that only cater to online enrollments, such as the University of Maryland, University College, Arizona State University's online university, and so forth and so on. There are over 576,000 students enrolled in just online universities. Um, public universities. For private, for-profit uh, sector, there are still over 500,000 students enrolled simply online. Now the University of Phoenix leads, but close behind them is Grand Canyon University, Walden, and American Public University. Um, and they still have healthy enrollments. Now for the private, not-for-profit sector, Western Governors University is the largest within the country. There's also Liberty University in Southern New Hampshire, New Hampshire and Excelsior College in New York. What this table really demonstrates is that there is room, substantial room for growth in the fully online sector in the United States. And there are some many universities that are fully online and doing very well. In total, there still remains quite a bit of room for growth in the development of exclusively online programs, which out of the 230,000 offered at all levels in the United States, only 10%, which is 22,000, are offered exclusively online. If we take a closer look, we can see that 8% of bachelor's degree programs provided in the United States are fully online. 11% of associate degree programs are fully online. And only 3% of research doctorates. Now, there's a higher percentage of professional practice doctorates, but three, the research doctorates, doctorates are the majority. Now there's something unique here, that for master's degrees, 16% of them are provided fully online, which is notably different from the other degree levels. There are three characteristics of the master's degree that make it more suitable for online delivery 
than the other degree levels, such as the associates, bachelors, and doctorate? Well, the first thing is that in order to enter a master's degree, a person would have already had to complete a post-secondary degree, which is a at least a bachelor's degree. So they already have experience in uh, knowing their study habits and fitting their uh, study habits into their day-to-day -day routine. Secondly, most master's students have professional experience and they're, moved, they're coming back to get a more senior level position. This means that uh, they are balancing professional lives and uh, personal lives and they're looking for a degree that has enough flexibility to give them the education but also to allow them to meet their responsibilities. An online education is primarily made to meet that need. And third, the degrees typically last from one to two years. And first, this is more manageable for students, but it's also more manageable for academic programs to develop these, uh, 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 these programs, which are composed of about between two. Within academic degree programs, the proportion of academic degrees that have been converted to on fully online programs is uneven. Business leads this pack with 21% of their academic programs being fully online. And as an overall proportion of academic programs provided throughout the country, uh, they lead with almost 6,000 uh, uh, programs. The health professions is second with 11% of their programs uh, being provided in the online format and almost 3,800 of these programs. There are almost 3,800 of these programs. Education is third, with 12% of the programs being provided fully online, and uh, there are about 2,600 programs. From there on, there are uh, a higher proportion of programs in some areas, such as criminal justice uh, and homeland security, which has 21%, or liberal arts programs, uh, which have about 24% of programs too, but their number, their actual numbers are actually smaller. Uh, in the field of public administration, there are uh, about 460 pr programs that are provided fully online. I really hope that you've enjoyed learning about the internet and its impact upon higher education and how academic programs have been transforming to meet the needs of this really internet revolution. I look forward to hearing from you again and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.